Um, I've been invited to, to visit with this class now, I don't know, for several years. Um, I keep getting invited back. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I don't know um, what interest you have, what brings you to the class. I, I don't know if what you know about Buddhist practice or what you don't know. What I can say is that um, I don't speak for all of Buddhism. Um, I'm a Zen Buddhist monk. I'm ordained in a Japanese Buddhist tradition. Um, there are two primary schools of, of Zen Buddhism practice in Japan, Rinzai and Soto. And I belong to the Soto Zen lineage of, of uh, the, one of the seven schools of Zen Buddhism. Um, I can't even, I won't even stand in front of you and pretend to talk for all of Zen. Um, what I, I, I was ordained in 90, I was, I was ordained in 1994. Um, I was ordained in Auschwitz, and in Poland. Um, Auschwitz, uh, for those of you who may not know, Auschwitz uh, was, uh, was a, uh, a Nazi death camp. Um, I was invited to be ordained in Auschwitz because it was the start of a pilgrimage for me where I walked from there, from that point, to Vietnam. Uh, 27 countries, 8 months, 5,000 miles. Um, that was the beginning of a, an essential part of my practice, which it was pilgrimage. Since that first pilgrimage, um, in total I've walked about 43 or 44,000 miles all, all over the world. I walk in robes, I walk without money. But I, I engage in this practice in a very traditional way. Um, but traditional from the perspective of being from the West, I am not Asian. So it, in some ways that supports me because I'm not, um, the practice that I engage in is not contaminated by Asian, Asian cultural references. Um, so I have a tendency to not be as uh, patriarchal and discriminating against women as is the case in most Asian traditions. Um, and I have escaped getting the trap of the institutionalization of Buddhist practice that um, has, has contamin contaminated or diluted the essential teachings in Asia, although it, it also happens here. Um, the reason that I was ordained in Auschwitz is a lot to do with my own history. Um, I am uh, I'm a disabled combat s soldier. Um, I served with the United States Army in Vietnam. I was there in 1966 and 67. Um, I was a crew chief on, I was a helicopter crew chief. Um, I crewed troop ships and gunships. Um, I served a little bit more than a year was injured very seriously, and then I spent the remaining nine months of my um, enlistment in hospital. Um, I was discharged um, August of 28th, 1968. From that point forward, um, my, well, my life was my life. But I was deeply and profoundly affected by my experiences in combat. And how, that, how, those, how the consequences of those experiences manifested itself in my life is what we call in Buddhist practice um, our inherited karma, which generates our suffering. Now karma is a word, a word that is quite familiar in the lexicon we hear people use the word all the time, karma. 
Yeah, that's your karma, you know. You're going to have bad karma, man. Or, oh, you're going to have good karma. But very little people really know what karma means. They have, they have a superficial understanding. Karma means what comes around goes around. So if, like if I were to, if I, if, if I were to treat you poorly, then I would be inviting that action back to me. Someone would treat me poorly. That's a, it's a, it's a very, um, it's not incorrect, but it's a very superficial understanding of the whole reality of karma. Karma exists in two primary forms, that which we inherit and that which we create. The karma which we inherit is passed on to us through all of the family generations that preceded us. So within me exists all those past generations. So there is no such thing as an individual self. I mean, even physiologically, I am only a manifestation of all those past generations. That's what that, G that, DNA, uh, that DNA programming is what gives me form. It, it influences everything about my makeup. Then the karma that I create is how the, uh, how the experiences, how I've, what I've inherited in my life and the experiences that I've been subjected to, how I act those out. Uh, so when I came back from the military, I was carrying all this inherited karma, suffering. Not, I've been responsible for uh, in, in, in the job that I had, I was responsible for a lot of death and a lot of destruction. And that always comes with a price. I'm not being conscious of the price and not being particularly keen to acknowledge the price. I always found someone to blame for that. It was the government's fault. It was my parents' fault. It was, uh, uh, it was always somebody else's fault. And if, if, if that wouldn't have happened to me, then I wouldn't behave like I behaved. Um, to, escape, to escape this, the senselessness, that, or the, to escape the existential pain that I felt in my life because I, I couldn't put a finger on what, was, what I felt. I just felt really alienated. I felt distant from everything. I felt separate from everything. Um, and I, I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and so I used medication to address that those feelings that I had that I didn't know that I had, that I didn't, then I didn't have any skill to, to work with them in a conscious way. The medications I took were both prescribed and self-prescribed. Uh, so by 1970, I was living homeless on the streets in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I lived in a, an abandoned car um, not far from the center of town. I lived on the streets for two years. Um, I was able to get off the street because of the generosity of a young man whom I do, I, I to this day don't remember his name. I just remember that I was, um, I was sitting in a doorway, and I was either drunk or high. And a young man came up to me. I might not have had a shower. I might not have bathed or changed clothes in probably a week, 10 days. I had a really big beard, and my hair was dirty. I mean, I just didn't look, I, I didn't look friendly or welcoming, I'm sure. But this young man approached me. And, and I do remember the exchange. He said. He said to me, he said, uh, what are you doing here? And, and I didn't know how to respond to his question. He said, you don't belong here, man. Why don't you come home with me? 
Now, living on the street, see, the homeless are often um, targets for where we can project our suffering. We can see the homeless as the problem. So rather than take response, rather than see what our responsibility is in the fact that we have homeless, and rather than seeing what we can do to support them, we rather see them as a problem and just want to get rid of them or not look at them. And so the homeless are quite often exploited and abused. They're abused through our thoughts, they're abused through our actions, they're abused through our speech. There was an occasion when I was on the street where um, I, was, I, mean, I was just using whatever drugs I could use and, and in this particular day I was injecting drugs and, and I had obviously sort of passed out in the middle of injecting drugs and, and suddenly I, I, I was awake, awakened and just sort of startled, I was startled into consciousness. And, what had happened is that there was, a, there was a man standing in front of me. He was uh, dressed in a th three-piece suit, dressed quite nicely, and in a briefcase. And the briefcase was sitting on the ground beside him. And what startled me awake was that he was urinating on me. <coughs> now, that's an obvious sign of violence against the anonymous. Because the homeless, are, like, homeless like the incarcerated, are anonymous. So there are places where we can project all of our suffering. They're the problem, rather than looking at us. Looking at how are we participating in this and the dynamics that create and keep alive cycles of suffering. So when this young man invited me back home to his house, I'm going like, oh, oh no, I don't think so. Because immediately I'm jaded, I'm skeptical because we're being homeless on the streets. You're anonymous, and so people can act out their violence and aggression towards you because you have no identity. It just is exactly what happens in military training. See, in military training, we are taught to dehumanize the enemy. To create an enemy, you must necessarily dehumanize people. And once we begin the process of dehumanization, in whatever form or shape it takes, we begin to lose contact with our own humanity. The karma that I inherit, I am conditioned to be sexist. By the fact that I'm born a white male, in the, by the fact that I'm born male, doesn't matter what color, by the fact that I'm born male in the society and structure, I'm conditioned to be sexist. Now if I just say to myself, oh, I don't want to be sexist, I'm not, like, I'm not one of them that it guarantees that I'm going to continue to act out my sexism and I'm going to act it out in ignorance because I'm going to blind myself to the fact that I'm doing it so that when, when you tell me, you say, no, nah, that's pretty sexist, I'm going to go, no, it isn't. Uh-uh, not me. No, I'm not a sexist. You don't understand. That's your stuff. I am, I am by the mere fact I'm born into this society and culture, you see, karma is also inherited from the collective conscious. So not only the family generations, but the collective conscious of which I'm a part. The collective conscious. Institutions of education, religion, commerce, politics, um, athletics, entertainment. That forms the collective conscious. Now all of these terms I was conscious of I was always conscious of these notions and ideas, but I didn't have a language to express them until I came in contact with Buddhist practice. That's what drew me so, clo that's what drew me so quickly to Buddhist practice because w what they were talking about was things that I always knew to be true. It just made sense. The other thing that drew me to Buddhist practice was that um, the essential teaching is states clearly, for my life I'm responsible. If I want my life to be different, I need to live differently. In order to live differently, I have to wake up to the suffering which I have inherited from those family generations and from the collective conscious of which I'm a part. And then I need to see how that manifests itself in my life and then I 
have to come up with a strategy to do things differently. I went home with this young man, and I cannot tell you why. He, he looked similar to you, except he had a bigger beard. No, it's true, as, as I remember it. And I remember, oh, excuse me. I remember that um, he brought me home to his apartment. And he said, the bathroom's in there. There's soap in the shower. Please help yourself. How nice. <laughs> I know. And then he, then he said to me, um, you know, there's some extra clothes. See, if, if my clothes fit you, there's some extra clothes in there. Um, please help yourself. So there's food in the refrigerator. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. Then he said, um, I, I have to go to work. I'm, I'll be back at, I don't know, I'll be back at a certain time. Now, he left me alone in his house. Someone he'd just taken off the street, you know, uh, drunk. I don't know what kind of condition I was in. Uh, I, I took a shower. I cut off my beard. Um, I put on some clean clothes. I stayed with him about two or three days. And then I went back. I, I, I left Pittsburgh and went back to the, the town where I, was, where I had been living, where I was going to college, a place called Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. Slippery Rock is about 75 miles to the north of Pittsburgh. Uh, I got to Slippery Rock and I finished my degree. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get clean. I continued to use drugs of all sorts. And I continued to create more suffering. My drug use e escalated. It, it, it was a dynamic that, and when I talk about drugs, I'm talking about alcohol as well. Alcohol is a drug. Now, not to ever be confused about that. I mean, it was the most easily, easily accessible to me. And it was, it's interesting how easy it is to, to slip into addiction to these sorts of things when there's no space. I mean, when, when there, there seems to be so much space and I feel so alone and so confused and, and I, just, I just don't want to feel like that anymore. And so I look to something outside of me to fill me up, to take away that sense of loneliness, isolation, the sense of despair, a sense of pointlessness. And, and I felt all of those things. What happened is that in the, in, initially I took the drug, w whatever it was, and then the uh, drug took the drug, and then the drugs took me. So they reached a point where I didn't have a choice about it. I, I just was unable to stop and didn't know that I was unable to stop. My, so drugs kept making the decision. Drugs and alcohol kept making the, my decisions for me until um, 1983. And, 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 and as my drug use escalated, my inability, to control, my inability to recognize how I was affected by, my, uh, by the karma which I inherited, my suffering, the more I began to act that out. And one of the primary ways I acted this out was through violence. The more often I came in contact with law enforcement. And uh, so my life was, so I was trapped in this funnel of downward, a downward spiral. Um, in 1983, um, I found myself living in Massachusetts. Well, actually, in 1980, I, I found myself living in Massachusetts in a small town named Concord, just west of Boston, 26, 27 miles. Um, and and um, I had a wife, and I was attempting to be a regular person. Now, I went to a bank to apply for a loan. And when they put my social security number into their system, they asked me who I was. I had, so, I had been so effective at removing myself from any contact with, the, with any connection with the, the, with the social system of which I'm a part. That, that, that there was just no record of me. I sort of just didn't exist. And, 
And that began a process. 1983, I went into a, an alcohol and drug rehabilitation center in New Hampshire. Um, I, got, uh, I stopped using drugs, taking drugs and alcohol. Um, and I have stayed stopped since that time. Um, seven years into this process, I came directly in contact with how deeply I had been affected by my service in war. I didn't really, I, I, I was connected with a therapist and I was doing other things to, um, self-help sort of things to support me um, in sort of waking up to my life. And, and this, uh, this social worker said to me, um, Right. He, she said, you know, that because the traditional avenues available to you as a soldier, as a combat veteran, don't work for you because of your level of distrust, she said, there's this, there's this Buddhist monk who does some work with Vietnam veterans who's had some success. Um, it would be really great if you could visit this guy, but his monastery is in France, and I mean, I was unemployable. Um, I just I couldn't hold a job. Um, I, it was all I could do to sort of get through a day. Um, this, um, and I, when I heard the word Buddhist monk, I thought oh, religion. As soon as I thought religion, it conjured up all those images of my past and my childhood, and of course, what gets thrown at us living on the street, and, and. I immediately just shut down. But of course, having made a commitment to her that I was willing to do anything to, to really heal, I said, oh, how wonderful. Um, but, and then she said, well, he, he lives in France, and his monastery is in France, and, and because and he just wouldn't be able to go, it's too far away. And that part of me went, <sighs> And she said, well, there's some books. He's written some books he could, Here's, here's the titles, you can read the books. I said, oh, great, I'll do that. I never picked up one. About three weeks later, though, um, I was in this therapy group, and a, a woman in this therapy group, um, after the group, handed me a catalog from a place called the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. It's a holistic center. And um, this monk that the social worker had talked to me about was going to be at the Omega Institute uh, facilitating a retreat for veterans. And I was in trouble. Because, <laughs> man, I wasn't about to go. Because I thought, wow, a Buddhist monk, what could this ever do for me, you know? My argument, of course, was really sound. I said, well, that's just really great. I'd like to go, but I don't have any money. And she turned the page. And it highlighted with a pink marker, uh, we give scholarships. So I was bagged. And I went to this retreat. Um, not willingly, but I went. I was really, the truth is, I was really afraid. And I remember going in the first night. Um, walking into a room. It was a room about half the size of this. And there's an exit door here and here, and it was a small stage, like portable stage. And I came in through the side exit door and sat in this corner so I could get away quick if I had to. Because groups of people, I could hardly stand to be in groups of people, especially people I didn't know. It was very fearful for me. And I just didn't want to know. Uh, but I, I was willing to take a risk to do this because I understood that the group was veterans. So uh, I could at least feel somewhat uh, safe with a group of people with a shared experience. Well, there were about 80 people there, and only 25 of us were veterans, but I didn't know that. When this monk came out on stage and started to talk, the moment he opened his mouth and started to talk, I burst into tears. Because I realized I still saw him as the enemy. He was Vietnamese. Now, I'm sure that I was told he was Vietnamese, but I didn't know that. And I just, I just, I just burst into tears. Um, because I understood, not so much intellectually, because when I would talk about understanding, I'm talking about understanding from this Buddhist 
perspective, which has always made sense to me. Understanding is not the accumulation of information. It's about uh, coming to a place of knowing beyond intellect. Because our intellectual, uh, our, our, our intellect, what we think about things, is shaped by the conditioning, that suffering that we inherit. So our thoughts aren't really our own. Now, I knew, I've known that forever. I knew that. But when this monk started to talk, he was saying things that I knew, that I've known to be true since I was 10. It just made sense to me. And I also realized that if I still saw him as the enemy, then I had not yet um, come in contact with my own humanity. And that sort of explained some of the things that I had been experiencing in these seven, first seven years of attempting to clean up my life. See, I cannot clean up my life. I can only put myself in the, into, the, into the circumstances where that process can take place. Huh? And it is really about a disciplined, committed spiritual practice. Doesn't matter what I think, doesn't matter what I believe, it matters what I do. This is what he said. Doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you believe, matters what you do. The other thing they said, that he said to me that was critically important, and I share this with people when I get invited to speak, is that um, I, I'm not here to convert people. I'm not here to sell people on Buddhist practice. In fact, from my perspective, there are far too many Buddhists in the world already. The world doesn't need more Buddhists. The world needs more Buddhas. You know, people who call themselves Buddhists, they wrap themselves up in an identity. And, and that's merely because they haven't yet understood the essential teachings, which bring us to the reality that you and I are not separate. You have different glasses than I do. You have a different gender than I do. You have a bit more hair than I do. Yeah. Your clothes are a different color, but this is not who we are. In that place of knowing beyond intellect, this is the place where all existence is interconnected. There's no higher or lower. There's no superior or inferior. What an incredible place to be. In this retreat, um, at the conclusion of this retreat, I remember going up to the, to the assistant of this monk. And I wanted to apologize for all of the killing that I had been responsible for. I was crying, the snot was running out of my nose. I mean, I was really, I mean, I was crying. And this was a, like a huge thing for me. Because yeah, I'm, I'm this tough guy, you know. And, and I, just, I, just, I just didn't have any control over this. And I, but I couldn't say it. I couldn't say, I couldn't own it. I couldn't own that in that moment. What, all I could say was, I want to go back to Vietnam. I don't even know why I said that. It just sort of came out of my mouth. And the, and the nun said to me, listen, before you go, if you go back to Vietnam right now, you'll be exploited. And she said, come to our monastery. Let us help you. We can help you. You know, I, I, I had such a, it's like a huge weight lifted off me in that moment because I, I've been waiting for somebody to say that to me all my life. No one in this country ever said that to me. Not with the sincerity with which this, this nun said it. And can you imagine, this is my enemy. Come to our monastery, let us help you. We can help you. I, I, immediately I was filled with joy. I was still, well, I don't know, joy, it's a word I use. I, was, I just had this exhilarating feeling. And I said, yes. I said, I'd love to come, but I don't have any money. Because their monastery is in France. 
And then they said, don't worry about the money. Make the commitment. You make the commitment, let's see what happens. I said, okay, I'll come. Two hours after I said, okay, I'll come, I was filled with the deepest fear that you can imagine. A fear that I'm sure that has run my life for a long time. The fear, what the fear, the way the fear manifested itself in thought, because feelings give rise to thoughts. Thoughts and feelings, when they come together, form our perceptions of the world, which we hold as absolute fact. When they're not, it's smoke and mirrors. My fear told me the only reason they want you to come to Vietnam, or come back to their monastery, is that when you get there, they're going to put you in prison, and they're going to try you for war crimes, and then they're going to murder you. This is what my fear was telling me. This is how that fear manifested itself in thought. Um, I remember calling up the social worker and calling some of the people in my support network and talking to them about this. Because isolation, of course, is, is not living away from other people. Isolation is living in a world full of secrets that I don't share with other people. That if, I, if I'm not talking to people about what's going on, what I'm thinking, what I'm acting, what's going on in my life, you know, then I'm living in a life of isolation. It doesn't matter. I can, be in, I can be surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people. If I'm not, if the people don't know what's happening with me, then, I'm, then this is a world of isolation. Or if I'm constructing, an idea, I'm constructing a version of what my life looks like or supposed to look like so that I can have people around me. And it's not the truth. I'm living in a world of isolation. So I, I talked to these people. The social worker said, well, you know, that's probably not going to happen. And, and, I, and, and, and I already had a sense that it probably wasn't going to happen, but it was so real for me. Absolutely real. And finally, I, and I just, it, this is the other, I just surrendered. I said, okay, I'm going. And if this happens, if this is what's going to go down, then maybe at last I will have some peace. Because I just wanted peace. I, what, you know, my, I wanted my idea of peace. Uh, and about three or four days later, letters started arriving at my home in Concord. And people were sending me money. They were, people at the retreat were sending me money so that I could buy a ticket so that I could go. They were, wanted to support me in this process. I didn't ask anybody. I didn't say anything. I don't know how this actually happened, but it took place. And the nun didn't say anything either. But somehow the word got out I'd been invited. I couldn't go because I didn't have the funds, and people started just spontaneously to offer me that support. So I went. I went with the intention of staying for three or four weeks. And I remember um, I got on a plane, and when I was landing in Paris, um, it was agreed that the, the nun said that people will come pick you up, and they'll take you to the train station. So because I had to, I landed in Paris, and I had to take a, a train to another town, and then take another train to a smaller town, and. I, my mind, man, my mind, my mind was saying to me, now it's going to happen. You're going to get off the plane. And when you walk into the, into the airport, when, when those people identify you, they're going to they're gonna just gun you down on the spot. And, and then my mind kept doing things like that with me. But when, I, when, I, when the people I identified, they, they had a sign, and they identified themselves to me, and I walked up. Um, the first thing they did is they offered me some cookies. <laughs> I go, you know, it, you, the mind, the mind, is such a, the mind is such a curious place, and yet we hold on to our thoughts as if they're absolute facts. Our thoughts are merely a perpetuation of our suffering. All that karma we've inherited through these past generations, through the collective conscious of which we're a part. The thoughts are formed out of the desperation of our isolation and loneliness. To wake up to this suffering is entirely possible. 
It comes to this disciplined, committed spiritual practice rooted in self-reflection. The truth of all things is known in silence. In the silence you find the truth. And the truth isn't what we call truth. Yes, I mean, what, what's the date what's the day today? 19th. So in a month and two days, I'll be 65. Yeah, check that out, huh? 65. I never expected to live past 23. <laughs> and I got to be 30, and I went, oh, man, what am I going to do now? Now I'm about to turn 65, and I go, man, I hope I have a couple hundred left because I'm just sort of getting a handle on this. And it's because of this, it's because of what, it's because of what's been offered to me through Buddhist practice. Five precepts. I mean, I've taken more than that in my ordination, but there's five basic precepts. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Practice change conduct and don't take intoxicants. Five. Don't kill. It says, it says don't kill. It doesn't say don't kill except. It says don't kill. Don't kill. Don't accept. Don't kill and don't support any act of killing in the world or in your life. So, I go, wow, that, that's... That's pretty easy to do, you know. But when you really, when you sit with that commitment in reflection, you have to look, I have to look at all the ways in which I support institutions of killing. And what am I willing to do to live differently? What am I really willing to do? Do I want to wake up or do I want to just continue to live in this, this life of quiet desperation where, I'm, where I can constantly then just blame external things for the discomforts that I have in my life. I, 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 it doesn't, it never was a solution for me. It never got me anywhere. I wanted my life to be different. And I was told, you want your life to be different? You need to live your life differently. I am a murderer. I killed people. And you can't use the mask of war to justify that. I mean, you can intellectually, but it, it doesn't change the truth of what I did. This finger pulled the trigger. And I live with the consequences of that every day. The, the peace that I was seeking for, the peace that I was looking for, which, is, which was the absence of responsibility, doesn't exist. What I've, been able to, what I've been able to experience as a result of a disciplined, committed spiritual practice rooted in self-reflection, I've been able to establish peace with my unpeacefulness. This is like this because that was like that. Now, as this is, that will become. I, if I, if I, uh, I don't need any meat, no fish, no poultry. I don't want to support the institutions of killing. I make sure that when I eat, I eat as, as, uh, as disciplined as I can. And it's not difficult so that I enter myself more in the natural life cycle of things. You take a, and people often say to me, well, I mean, don't vegetables have lives? Aren't there, does their life any, is their life any less worth than a cow? And I go, no, absolutely not. But you think about this now, a cow, what's the average life expectancy of a cow? Does anyone know? 20 years? That's close. Yeah, right around 26 years. The average life expectancy of a cow is around 26 years. When are most cows butchered? At what age? About two years. Yeah, two to four. Some younger. So they're, they're, so they're raised. They're, har they're raised to be harvested before they're ripe. Most vegetables, if you harvest them before they're ripe, you can't eat them. If you harvest them after they're ripe, you can't eat them. You harvest them right at the point of death, right at their ripest point. So I enter myself more naturally into the life cycle of things. And, and, and it's, these precepts are not rules to be followed rigidly. 
But there are guidelines in my life. So through a disciplined, committed spiritual practice, rooted in self-reflection, I get to see over time how, how these precepts manifest themselves in my life. How they inform me. And my, my life is continually, I'm continually in a place of change. So, for me, Buddhist practice is, is, is not a... I mean, I've studied and read, there's, there's the Pali Canon, there's 82 volumes within the Pali Canon, and it's the full body of teaching and, and commentaries, and there's the Dhammapada, which is the essential uh, book of teachings, uh, allegedly. And, and there's a lot of... There's the... There's a lot of written on the Four Noble Truths, which is supposed to be the first teaching that the Buddha ever gave when, after he achieved Great Awakening. Um, I've read and studied all of these things. I've read and studied them all in relation with a, a, with a teacher. And I continue to read and study. It's important to, to inform myself. But to not hold on to that information as absolute fact and to not use that information as a way to give me identity. Uh, to give me uh, prestige or power or to create separation. This is, this is all how Buddhist practice grows in my life. It's a very organic process. Um, I, I, I get invited to travel all over the world. I work particularly with cultures of violence, um, supporting them to live differently. And it's not about converting them it's not about saying if you if you now come and, and do if you now convert yourself over here and you do this then that'll all stop. It's not about that. I go here's some tools, basic essential tools. You can if you take these. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you think. Just take these tools and if you use them in your life, they they can help you to discover what you need to do to live differently. They will inform you. You know, it's not about what we believe, it's about what we do. So how do we take this information and put it into practice? That was what's so important about, um, that was what made so much sense to me about Buddhist practice, why I was drawn to it. Because it's truths that I've known that have been self-evident to me since I was 10, but that the society and culture which I grew up in, rural farming community in Northwest Pennsylvania, conditioned me away from. My father had been a soldier in war, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. Most of the men in the community where I grew up had been soldiers in the Second War. And no one ever talked about it. Never, no one ever told the truth. They didn't. Now I'm committed to a life of poverty as part of my vows. And in Christian terms you say chastity, poverty, and obedience. And It's not quite like that in Buddhist practice, but it's similar to that. Um, I, live, I live on the donations of a larger community. If, 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 if people benefit from the tools that I offer them and they want to support me in continuing to do what I do, they are welcome to do that. If, if they don't want to, they, they don't have to. The teachings are for free. And I, I don't hold them back from people who don't want to give or don't have enough to give or don't just simply don't care to. And I don't just go where it's easy and comfortable. I just don't go into circles where other Buddhists are practicing and do my thing there. I go into prisons. I do uh, retreats on the street. Um, I go into, um, I, I go right into the midst of profound cultures of violence to support them and to, to give them the tools that offer them the possibility to live differently. But the other thing is I only go where I'm invited. So I don't force myself into any place. And it's just, it's phenomenal how my life has opened up as a result of not chasing after ideas and dreams, but just concentrating on this disciplined practice, concentrating on waking up to my suffering and seeing what develops from that. The very first teaching that the Buddha ever offered were the Four Noble Truths. First truth, there is suffering. Suffering doesn't mean we have to suffer, it's just the first truth, there is suffering. Second truth, uh, where there's a cause, suffering, there's a cure. Third truth, 
Abraham. See, the suffering. Oh, the second truth is the causes of suffering. Selfish desire and craving backed by ignorance. And then the third truth is where there's a cause, suffering, there's a cure. And the fourth truth gives the cure. If you want to know what the cure is, then you're going to have to study. I'm not going to do all the work for you. Huh? But that there is suffering doesn't mean we have to suffer. Because some people would say to me, um, in just a moment I'll finish and then I'll open up for your questions. And I do this wherever I'm at. Under whatever circumstances I'm in, I always open up for people's questions because it is for me the most important part of the exchange. That, that there is an exchange. People say to me, oh, man, you Buddhists are boring. You know, it's depressing to listen to you, suffering, all, just all this suffering. I want to be happy. And I go, that's suffering. Yeah? Because it's our ideas of happiness that lead us, that keep these cycles of suffering alive. Because of those ideas of happiness, once we get it, it never lasts. It doesn't sustain. And in fact, we may not ever get it. And in the process of chasing after our ideas of suffering, or our ideas of happiness, we miss the things that really make us happy. We miss it because we're so narrowly focused on our ideas of it. If only, if only, I, if only I had that, if only I had a new car, then I'd be happy. And I get that new car, and I go, then I'm, oh, I know, I get that new car, then I'm driving around in fear that somebody's going to crash into me. So where, where did all that happiness go? Or I had the new car for two or three weeks, and I go, and this seat doesn't, and this seat's not quite right. You know, and, and then there's always, there's always something. So the happiness that we chase after is so transient. But the happiness that can be discovered when I let go of my ideas of happiness, commit myself to a disciplined spiritual practice rooted in self-reflection, is immeasurable. It's unspeakable. I can only point in the direction. That is, after all, the responsibility um, that I, it's been passed on to me. Um, I don't have anything... I, mean, I can't wake people up. I can only point in a direction. The rest is up to you. Enough for me. What I'll do now is I'll open this up to questions. You can ask me any question you want. Nothing's out of bounds. Um, I don't really want to get into any discussions. If you disagree with something, I said it's fine. Um, whatever your position is, it's, I'll tell you in front, it's already correct. And this whole point of discussing and arguing is also at the root of war. Just attempting to, sh to, to sort of show you the rightness of my position versus the wrongness of your position. And, you know, in, in, in the relative understanding of the world, there are 10,000 versions of the truth. All of them are correct, and all of them are incorrect. It just depends on your angle of perception. Hmm? Questions? Yes, please. Um, well, I have a couple of questions. One at, one at a time, please. <laughs> What is the incense for? Ah, that's a great question. The incense uh, uh, metaphorically represents a couple of things. Um, on a formal altar, a formal, a formal altar in the, the meditation hall is comprised of five, uh, comprised of the five basic elements. There would be a flower here that represents earth. There'd be the candle, which represents the energy, which is our life. There would be a bowl here with water in it. We're 90-some percent water. And then there'd be an icon of the Buddha, which were, in this case, it represents space and consciousness. See, the Buddha is not something or someone that we worship, but rather an, uh, the icon is a, is a representation and a motivation of what's possible for us to achieve. So the five elements are the five elements that give this body existence. So the altar is not other than this body. In the case of the incense, it represents the air that we breathe. Also, incense has the, uh, is used 
metaphorically as an instrument of purification. So in the beginning, when I do the incense offering, I do an incense offering in the ten directions. And it purifies the space that we occupy in. I, mean, I don't know if it really does or not, but I, I do it. It can't hurt. You, know, you just never know. So I do it. It's not like I actually really believe that, so dogmatically that that's what's happening. But that's what's said to happen, and so I, I do it. it. It may be true and it may not. <laughs> but, it, it, but what it does, it serves a purpose of supporting me in the moment to just sort of settle. Because every time I step in front of a, bunch, a group of people, I'm anxious. I, I, I'm nervous. And, and it, it just helps me to take my attention from out here just bring it back to here and steady. So the t ten directions are north, then north, northeast, east, east, southeast, south, um, south, southwest, then west, and then west, northwest, and then north, and then up and down. Ten directions. So that's the ritual that I did and the reason I did it. Your other question? Uh, what is the clanging of the... Okay. Can you do it in the bag? <laughs> Let's see if this works. Um, we actually call this a bell of mindfulness. So the sound of the bell communicates to... Well, there are two qualities. One is this quality of being present in the moment. And part of that becomes to pay attention to your breath. So when you are in contact with your breath, you cannot be in any other place than just here right now. So um, as we have the tendency in, in talks to often drift away, you know, often our thoughts are someplace else, our body is sitting here, but we are any other place. It, it does invite us back to be more present in the here and now. And at the same time, the bell is also a clock. So it communicates the passing of time. So at events, I usually speak with Claude Anshin before, um, how much time we have available. And then I can also at certain intervals let the bell sing so that the bell can then also remind him that time has passed and structure the, the event. So I did two bells at 40 minutes, which then is kind of the invitation sooner or later to start with question and responses. <laughs> so that also gives him more the opportunity to really be present to the talk instead of you know, looking on the clock and being that concerned. You just have the, the sound of an instrument communicate that. I also like it because instruments are generally, um, they are not bound to language. So you can use it any place, anywhere, and people generally know. You hear a sound like this, it's about paying attention. You don't quite know what to, perhaps, but it does bring you back to the present moment because pretty much everyone thinks, I don't know what this is, but she's doing something. So thanks for asking. It's one of the questions that often doesn't get asked, um, kind of the kind of obvious question. So I'm really glad you put it out right in front. Thank you. Welcome. Can you explain why you're both wearing the clothes that we're wearing? <laughs> She's wearing black and you're wearing purple. <laughs> <laughs> why? Well, see, why is a question I never respond to? Because it's unanswerable. <laughs> I mean, really, you, you ever talk with a, a four-year-old at the dinner table? You say, um, you didn't finish your peas. You got to eat your peas. Like, why? And then you go, well, because, la, la. And they go, well, why? OK, what is the purpose of <laughs> different colors? Yes. In the, in the lineage which I'm ordained, um, and, and Kenshin's ordained by me. The, the black, this is called a rakasu, raksu, R-A-K-A-S-U. Um, it's a, an everyday version of the more formal robe that we wear in, when we're in, in the meditation hall or in the temple. Um, it's just, we can wear the robe all the time under all circumstances. And we can work with it. It doesn't get in the way. It doesn't hinder us. The robe is a symbol of the vows that we've taken. And it also represents the full body of teaching that we are committed to. Black is the first and essential color. I also have a black one. And the purple indicates that I, 
in the, only in the lineage in which I'm ordained now. The purple indicates that I am authorized to teach. It, so it's, it's, it's informative rather than hierarchical. Yeah. Because you catch on quick. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. Um, there is a meditation hall in, there is a meditation center in Mary Esther. Um, it's, it's located at 9 Magnolia Drive. Actually, it's located at 7 Magnolia Drive. Um, and on Saturday mornings at 8, it's open for, um, it's open to the, for public sitting. Um, there's a group of people, there's a small group of people who come uh, regularly. Um, if you were interested to come and visit the place and just generally see what it, see what's going on there, um, can leave you with an email address. I'm a 21st century monk. <laughs> I have a laptop and I have a cellular phone. All these are donated. So um, text message, email, I'm all good with that. Um, you could write and we can set an appointment for you to come visit or on Saturdays you can just come. If you would like to come and experience a, a, a sitting meditation, receive some instruction, experience sitting meditation, experience some recitations, you're, you're welcome to do it. You're welcome to join us. Um, I would just say that you need to be there no later than 15 minutes before 8. And again, it, it, it doesn't matter what you believe, it doesn't matter what you think. Actually, what I tell people is the process of self-reflection, this process of meditation can take you more deeply into whatever your faith might be. Yeah. This is an interesting other thing about Buddhist practice is one doesn't have to convert. Huh? I mean, I, I, have a, I have people who, I have people who study with me who, um, there's a, a nun, Catholic nun uh, from Colombia who studies with me. I have Protestant pastors that study with me. I, I, have, um, uh, and I have a couple of imams in Germany who um, they study with me and they informally study with me um, because they find that this practice helps them to go more deeply into their own traditions. I, I like that. Questions? Yes, please. Um, in some cultures and religions, women are considered not as um, worthy to be teachers or in that same standing as a man. How are women considered in the Buddhist community? Well, as I mentioned earlier, in Asia, Mm -hmm. um, what you described is actually the case. Generally speaking, um, it's, it's, often, it's often stated in Asian countries that if you're a woman and you're studying, in, if you're a Buddhist nun, then you commit your practice um, to purify your existence in this form with the hope that in, in your next life you can be born as a man because only men can become enlightened. Now, as I said, this has nothing to do with the essential teaching because if, when you go into study, you'll see that, in fact, that was not the position uh, according, to the, according to the existing literature. It was not the position of the Buddha himself. Um, this is developed through the institutionalization of Buddhist practice in these Asian countries. Here in the U.S., there are any number of uh, female abbots of temples. There are any number of women who teach, who are empowered to teach. So here in this country, that, that, that discrimination in Buddhist circles doesn't exist. Unless those, unless those Buddhist circles are um, Asian, Asian dominated. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's enough. Yes, please. Do you sleep? Do you uh, sleep in a monastery? Is there a special place that you live? Well, when 
Up until recently, I had been traveling about 300 days a year. I am by vow permitted only to stay in a place for three days. And, and then it's about moving. Uh, those some guidelines exist in, uh, in, in uh, the Vinaya, which are the, the laws and which are the, which are the t structures that sort of inform monastic practice. Um, recently, back in April, uh, one of the people who are very, who, uh, who are critical, whose support in the work that I've been in called to do has been so critical, um, fell very seriously ill. Um, so I have um, been traveling less and so that I can be present to support them in their process of recovery, which has to be my first commitment. Um, so just now, um, the, the, this meditation center in Mary Esther is it's just in a, it's in a housing area. It's one of the old, original developments in Mary Esther's uh, Rosewood housing area. It's between 98 and Hollywood. And Mary Esther cut off. Um, the houses are residential, with the exception of the meditation hall, which was a, a building, which was a, at one time it was a two-car carport with a, uh, a, a shop, a workshop, uh, which I converted. I converted it into a meditation hall and an entryway. So there's a bathroom and a, a private room for, for interviews and, and a place for formal sitting. Um, other than that, it looks pretty ordinary. Just another house on the block. Yeah, there are for, there are formal centers. I mean, the my home temple is in Los Angeles. But really, it, it, I mean, you you can see by the landscaping, you can see something's up. But it's really it's just they're just residential homes. And then the the main what the the main temple part of the resident is they just have renovated the downstairs of one of the two-story houses and the, they opened it up and the downstairs became the meditation hall. So it's nothing fancier, nothing separate or particular. The interesting thing is that Buddhist practice and daily life aren't two things. So it's how does this manifest itself in our daily lives? You know, this meditation and daily meditation isn't something we do other than daily life. It's to see how meditation, how everything we do in our daily life is a reflection of a meditation practice. Question. What is a Zen daily practice rooted in contemplation? What's a Zen daily practice? An example of one. What's it look like? <clears throat> Depends. Let's say. Uh, we're up every morning. We go and uh, sit. We go into the. We, we have some rituals that we do um, with incense offerings uh, around the buildings, and we do a period of silent sitting, and then we do some recitations, and then we get into the day. And the day comprises of whatever the day offers. There's some administrative things to do. There's um, uh, like I just finished painting a lot of the buildings, or nearly finished painting uh, the buildings and things. And there's always some cutting grass. Like I leave here and go back to the center and cut the grass, you know. So it's, but it's work meditation. So it's not just cutting the grass. It's an opportunity to practice. And then there's, we eat one meal a day. That happens around somewhere between three and five. And, uh, and then in the evening, um, we sit again, but we usually, when it's an informal, when it's informal, we sit uh, quietly. We sit in our, our spaces where we sleep, uh, and we do recitations. In a more formal, in a more formal circumstance, uh, I would be, if I'm living in a, a more formal monastery, or if I'm living in a, in a designated monastery and I'm there to study, and I'm there for a particular study period, 
my day starts at like 3 30 4 o'clock in the morning I'm up and then we begin sitting at 4 30 and we sit from 4 30 to 9 in the evening now that's interspersed with periods of study and work and, and eating but we practice in silence I mean no talking at all none and in and depending on on the particular practice period that silence is also no eye contact uh, But that differs from monastery to monastery, from place to place. Um, this Saturday, at in in uh, at, at the meditation center in Mary Esther, there's a full day of more formal practice. There will be a, a there'll probably be there could be anywhere from eight to fifteen people there, and we'll start at nine. We start at 9 o'clock and go until 4, 4.30. So they'll be sitting and there'll be, well, I'll introduce people into the basic forms of meditation practice, sitting, recitations, work, study, um, and eating. It's free. You want to come, come on down. And then you can have it for yourself. Please. So there's no, you don't read newspapers, TV, exercise, no, I do all those things. You do all those things. I do. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I, I read I read newspapers. Okay. I usually read them online. Okay. Um, I, I I watch um, I don't watch TV right. per se. I mean exactly. Did you watch the debates? No. Okay. You know, it only inflames the mind and creates more suffering. <laughs> no, I'm serious. No, I'm I'm absolutely serious. It's not just about. It's, just, it's not just about this presidential debate or the vice presidential debate. It's when we debate about anything. Like you have a particular position around women's rights. I guess, by the nature of your question. No, I was just... Okay. Interested. Well, you had, you had a curiosity around that. Yes, yes. And, and of course, and, you know, I could respond in a certain way and it could stimulate a certain reaction and then we're in a debate about who's right and who's wrong and... That, those, that's really the foundation of war. That's true. And so, no, I, I don't. Okay. But I do vote. Oh, I absolutely do vote. Because, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a right and a privilege that I've earned. Yes. And, and I'm going to exercise it. Um, but I, I inform myself. I don't depend on the media to inform me. I don't because the debates are I, debates are just a form of theater, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I don't depend on them to to inform me. But there's a lot, there's information available to me where if I I really want to know, I do the work of finding out. Good. Yeah. So, um, and the, 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 so the television I watch is like right now. Um, I, I've had donated a, a subscription to Netflix. Mm -hmm. So I can stream it online. Right. So right now I'm I'm watching my way through um, uh, uh, Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> yeah, all the episodes of Star Trek Voyager. And I just recently finished um, watching my way through um, Star Trek. The for the very first not so there was Star Trek. There's Next Generation. Then there's Voyager and. Deep Space Nine? What's that? Deep Space Nine. No, no, not Deep Space Nine. I haven't got there yet. Oh. But it was this, it was the original, you know, it was like before Kirk. Okay. So it was that one. So I watched my way through four seasons of that. So I, I, I do that sort of thing. You had a question? Yes. What's the um, meaning of, or what is the relevance of just one meal that you mentioned? Yes, and we do a recitation of meal gatha. This food is the gift of the whole universe, the earth, the sky, and much hard work. May we live in a way that makes us worthy to receive it. May we transform our unskillful states of mind, especially our greed. May we take only foods which nourish us and prevent illness. We accept this food so that we may realize the path of practice of love, compassion, and peace. So it's, it's about... Uh, taking not more than I need, not less than I need, but only what I need. 
I always say you, you oughtn't to ever see a fat monk. So in the morning I have a cup of tea. Really, the, the, the way the Vinaya is written is, is that we're, we're not supposed to eat past noon. But because of the lifestyle that I live, that wasn't always possible. So the, I worked with a teacher. It was, he was a, an Indian man ordained in a Sri Lankan a Theravadan tradition. And, and I was working with him around the Vinaya. Because to be committed to the Vinaya in a Japanese Zen Buddhist uh, lineage is unusual. Um, so, but I wanted to really, I wanted, so I wanted to do it. So the person who ordained me said, well, you're going to have to find someone who can help you. So I was studying with him, and I said, well, what about this? Not eating past noon. And he said, well, wherever you're at, it's not past noon somewhere. <laughs> and I went, oh, that's a guy like that. Yeah. Um, here, first here. Um, I do. I have one. I have a son. And my son is now 40. 40. He turned 40 in, he turned 40 in April. He's a commercial airline pilot and he lives in Tucson. And, and I became ordained. I was not married to his mother and separated from him at a very young age because of my lifestyle. Regained contact with him when he was about eight or so, and, and worked very hard to develop, worked very hard to clean up the wreckage of my past so that I could be the father that he needed. And so, I, and so we, have a, we have a very, I appreciate the relationship that we have. Um, very adult, very mature, and very father-son, but not in a competitive kind of way. Um, I, I value him deeply. And he also manages the website for the Zolto Foundation, which Kenshin will talk to you a bit, a, bit, a bit about later. Yes, in the back, please. During your sitting sessions, do you try to avoid thoughts of the past or yeah. the future? It, it's impossible to avoid thoughts. It's one of the misconceptions of, of meditation practice. Um, when, when it's talked about, when, when, often people talk about meditation practice as quieting the mind and get rid of, getting rid of our thoughts. How much? Okay. That's the word. That's the strict word. But it's not, that's a word without understanding. Um, our, our mind's active. So there are always thoughts. But what happens through the process of meditation is we, we, learn, we begin to develop a relationship with our thoughts and our feelings um, so, that we can, so that we become the observer of our thoughts and feelings. So that our thoughts and feelings, don't, they lose the power of control over us. Um, we have them, we experience them, but we can evaluate them from different angles of perception. This is the, one of the benefits of a meditation practice for me. I mean, because of my military service, I haven't slept more than two hours consecutively in any night since 1967. It's still generally the case for me. Um, however, it's, it's, it's a non-issue. This is like this because that was like that. I don't need to change this. I need to learn to accept this is how this is. Now, what, how do I live with this? How do I develop a right relation with this reality? And that's the benefit of a meditation practice. Yeah. So yeah, the mind's going to be busy. And it takes time to develop this relation. That's why meditation practice is, it's just meditation practice, not medication practice. It's not about bang, gone. Yeah? It's about developing this conscious relationship with self and the world of which I'm an interconnected part. Last question. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, when you were talking about a diet and a, you never see yourself <coughs> a fat Buddha, and yet the icon of Buddha is always this sort of that's not, fat. No, no, that's not Buddha. Oh, it's not Buddha. No, that's it. That, that, that dude's called Hotai. Hotai is a, and this is interesting, a symbol of prosperity. 
But, and Hotai is this character, he's a, this is a jovial kind of character whenever he came into a village. Now, see, there isn't just one Buddha. There are multitudes of Buddhas. Buddha is only a word which means awake. It's not the guy's name. It just means, it's just a word which means enlightened. Uh, Sanskrit Pali word which means enlightened. So, um, yes, there is the statue of Hotai, which is a Buddha of prosperity. And I don't know why they always have fat people, this fat guy being a model for prosperity, but nonetheless, that's abundance. There's too much abundance, I guess. But so, yes, Hotai is the name of this. Generally, if you look at icons, if you look at the icons of, of uh, cultural representations of Buddha, they're not Hotai. Yeah. Um, I will bring this to an end. Um, I would ask you, though, to give Kenshin a few moments of your time. Um, that she's some details that she can pass on to you. Um, it's, been a very, it's been a real pleasure to come and to spend time with you, to meet you. I really appreciate your questions. Um, if there's any questions that pop up along the way, um, you can jot them down. Uh, you can pass them on to Joel if you want. He knows how to get a hold of us. Or, um, if you want, um, you can... Uh, I can leave you with my email address. You can write to me. Um, um, also, there's some copy of that book that was passed around. There's some copies of that book. Uh, if you're interested, um, it's for sale. Um, I'm told it's a really good book. And the publishers love it when you buy it. The proceeds don't come to me. We, I don't receive any of that. It all goes to the foundation, and Kenshin can talk to you about that. And that foundation is used to support the work that grows around as a result of my activities in the world. Because I am committed to vows of poverty. Um, so... Uh, I thank Joel for inviting me, and it's been a great pleasure to meet you. So, um, in gratitude, I, I bow to you. I'll, I'll say goodbye, because we may not meet again. But if we meet again, we meet again. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I actually don't have many more things to add. Claude Anshin covered most of it. So just if you want to take just a few minutes after this class, and there's no class coming directly afterwards, so we don't have to be concerned about moving quickly out of here. Um, there is this table with information materials. Again, there's Claude Anshin's book. It's called At Hell's Gate, A Soldier's Journey from War to Peace, which is his biography, but it's also um, generally outlining how Buddhist practice has worked in his life in a really practical way. There's a sign-up sheet where you can leave an address or email address if you like. Um, there's a donation box, and there's also some flyers from the foundation that he mentioned. It's called the Salto Foundation, and it's just a legal container that we created to be able to um, frame this work um, also officially, so we can also write tax certificates, those sort of things. It's a non-profit, it's spiritually based. It's not a, not a religious organization, but again, a spiritually based organization. And it supports the work that Claude Anshin does and some beyond that. Overall, it's really meant to support people in moving from a more violent place to a more peaceful place, however violence expresses itself in our life. You know, it's not always the military war, because as it has been said, the roots of war are deeply ingrained in all of us. So if you'd like to take a flyer, there's also my email address on, there's a phone number. So if you'd like to contact us or you know someone who could really be interested, just pass it on. Um, Todd Ansch is also willing to sign books if you like to have that signature in an original copy. Um, please just hang out with him and he will take the time to sit down with you and sign it. Um, that's all I have. If you still have some questions you'd like to address him with or me, we are also still going to hang out a bit after this class. And um, thanks for your interest, thanks for attending this class, and I hope you have many more interesting visitors to listen to. Thank you. Thank you.